evening everyone thank you for joining us today on the second edition of the break by break series it's a series where we talk the brightest minds across the world on building insurgent brands break by break with strong fundamentals the topic for the second edition is the story of purple lessons in resilience and and perseverance we have with us manish taneja co-founder and ceo of purple he's a very special founder i've known him for over 7 years uh he was an investor and investment banker before he started purple you know given our preference for capital efficiency at uh, dsc two questions founders often ask us is always around you know whether capital is a moat and how do you react when when peers raise a ton of capital and and i often use purple as the example to demonstrate that you can grow in a capital efficient manner no matter what what manish and team accomplished is phenomenal they managed to scale a business in a really tough category in a capital efficient manner despite two major challenges one being low margins poor customer loyalty and the second being the fact that their peers the likes of nike raised a ton of capital and there was a general perception in the investor community that it could be a winner take all outcome we'll get into the details in the chat it's also a timely conversation given what the world is staring at you know with the slowdown and investors across the board including the most aggressive ones talking about fundamentals etc this will be a wide ranging conversation so you know let me jump right in manish thank you so much for taking the time you know i know you're under the weather i really really appreciate it so oh, hi thanks ari and look forward to it uh, i hope this is useful no i'm sure it will and uh, audience throughout the conversation if you have any questions please post them in the q and a tab i have allocated 15 minutes uh, for for q and a towards the end of the conversation so manish let us start from the beginning how did you decide to to start purple what was the gap and was it a business call or you know something more personal no i think it was a business call <laughs> i think uh, i think personal calls can only go a limited way i think uh, you have to build for your consumers and uh, and it was a very simple call at that point in time the simple call was it's a it will be a large category you know 10 20 years down the line beauty as a category beauty as a category has perhaps the best cross margins you know across the value chain and beauty as a category has a very very high repeat so these were three sort of you know fundamentals that were in the favor of the category and we thought look if we can stay in the game for long enough uh, you know hopefully we'll get to experience those margins and category size and repeat you know that will make the business very sound so look all three of us three founders all three men come from tier 2 cities where we grew up so i grew up in north of india you know tier 2 city suya shoes my co-founder lived in central india in a probably a tier 3 tier 4 city and rahul grew up in southeast of india which is probably like tier 2 tier 3 city so i think we knew the kind of landscape that existed there there are still no beauty stores in these cities i mean india has been a beauty experience starved country and we thought you know e-commerce could be a way to bridge that gap where we would recommend the right products to consumers give them the right advice and hopefully they will buy products from us uh, look we were a little naive in terms of uh, what would be good enough for customers to stay with us but i think broadly that was the thinking that if you get into a large market if the market has good gross margins and if the market is high repeat then you should be able to build a decent business as long as you can build some sort of differentiation in the minds of consumers got it and it was uh, you know as you said there were three men selling beauty and cosmetics products now that yes. almost goes against the framework we use in terms of filtering founders which is you know around how well you understand the customer and nuances in consumer behavior so yes. how did you solve for that you know i think it's a mistake that investors make in using that as a judgment call on whether we know our problem really well or not i mean obviously we got passed on from many vcs because we were all men leading it so look you know i mean lots of vcs rejected us because they thought there was not a there was not a single woman co-founder and i look i wish i had one i mean it's not like it's a drawback i mean i would have loved to have a woman co-founder 
It's just that we didn't have one. But does that make us slightly less positioned to win in this category? The answer is no. If you look at it, uh, most of Unilever's senior executives are men. And most of the stuff they sell is to women. I mean, whether you look at skin cleansing, I have seen, I mean, we have an, a gentleman at Purple who used to run Lakme earlier. It's a makeup brand. So I think I think it's a misconception that VCs, VCs should overlook and just not take that as a, that against a few founders. And likewise, you know, I, I mean, a woman can build a category that hitherto men were probably building. So I think if you find founders who have good empathy and people who can relate to their customers more, even if they don't belong to the same gender, it should work. So if I speak to our customers or I am on, let's say there's a consumer research person interviewing our customers and I'm just listening into those customers, I can just feel the pain in their heart a lot more than what most people can do and that sort of works it you know like you need just one crack idea and sort of life then takes off from there on so so look i think it was tough to convince vcs early on that we as men could build a business in beauty but look now we've proven it wrong many times again so no, no, so it goes on yeah. in our favor no i think it's a lesson for everyone listening in that there's no one way to build a business and men can build women focused brands successfully and and as VCs, we are always fighting our biases and, you know, it's, it's important that we, we have an open mindset. So, so you guys started off on the journey and, uh, you know, at what point in the journey, you know, did you feel that you hit product market fit? And, you know, I know it's a term used loosely, but maybe the milestone or the phase when you felt you could take on the horizontals and, you know, and the likes of Nika who were better funded. So what was that point in the journey and, uh, you know, Please, please take us through that. Yeah, you know, I think it's not the right way to look at it. Maybe a better way to look at this is, let's think about a point where we thought we could build a large, sizable business in the beauty category. It's not about taking somebody on or not. I don't think you're building your business looking at competitors. I think then you're too distracted. No, absolutely. Uh, if I can rephrase, so, I think the question yeah. was more around at what point you think you can, you know, you could have built it sustainably while you know you had competitors and completely aligned with you on everyone yeah. you know playing at print. In all honesty, I think it took us a lot longer than it should have taken us. I think, and this is the advice that I have to all founders is so there was one thing that we did very well in our early years. We were always very frugal. We never resorted to discounting as a way to lead sales. Mm -hmm. I think it came from our DNA. Rahul used to be at Tata Sons and I used to work at Fidelity. Both of us come from very value-centric DNA saying if we're not creating value for our customers, our customers will not stick with us. Discount will only take us somewhere. But I think we were still fairly swayed by what market expected us to do. When I say market, I mean VCs. And so I think we ended up wasting a couple of years doing what VCs wanted us to do. Right. And I think that's a lesson in hindsight. And I think, you know, while we started in 2012, I think I think we had the real courage in 2017 when we had no money in the bank. 2016, 17, I thought were, 2016, I thought was a not a good year for us. We had demonetization. We had no capital in the bank. And at the same time, I think where I failed the most in that year was I didn't have the courage to follow my conviction and do what everybody else was expecting us to do. I think... I think you need to trust your your own capabilities because if you don't trust them, how will somebody else trust them? You need to demonstrate that those capabilities are leading to something good before others start trusting you. And for that, you have to take some contradictory calls towards the what versus what the market you know is taking and hope that you know you will stay in the game long enough to prove them right. So I'll tell you what we did in 2017 really well. We had very limited money in the bank. The money in the bank was less than $100,000. And we had some $200,000 of receivables from large FMCG companies. We said we will stop doing business with these large FMCG companies and start using whatever capital we had and data we used to sit on to create our own products and brands. Mm -hmm. I had never imagined it to turn out to be a gold mine like it has. But our data proved to be bang on in terms of what SKUs we launched and they turned out to be gold. It also turned out to be a negative working capital business because, you know, I used to get credit from manufacturers. And if you mark up your products 4x, which means if you sell only one fourth of the inventory you have bought, you basically have recovered the money that you need to pay to your supplier. 
and so from a working capital positive business and mm-hmm. low margin retailing business we turned it around into a high margin working capital negative business by mm-hmm. just stroke of one decision to say look let's trust our data and build products according to it to be honest we had spent the previous year selling trying to monetize that data by selling it to large fmcg companies and nobody would buy it because we mm-hmm. were not credible enough for them to buy this from i mean right. how could we replace a nielsen and we had no credibility mm-hmm. and we just wanted our data to prove itself right and so we started building products i think the second big contra thing that i think we did and look fundamentally these all things look right it's just that most people don't have the courage to pick it up and also most people don't have the tenacity to take it forward for long enough before it leads to fruition so in 2018 august or july sometime i took a call that we will start building our loyalty program mm-hmm. and most loyalty programs in the country are built on point system so if you shop for 100 rupees i'll give you 1 rupees of points back that's what most loyalty programs are they are actually a piece of crap nobody goes to a store mm-hmm. carrying a card and saying can i use some of my points because i shopped here for 5000 rupees last year mm-hmm. and also they come with lots of bells and whistles around you know you can't use it for more than one year you can't carry it forward all that nonsense Mm-hmm. we said we will ask customers to pay money for our program and we will offer them special services because see otherwise what happens is in a country which is value very value centric nobody wants to pay the customer mm-hmm. doesn't want to pay for the service the seller doesn't want to pay for the service then how do we make money as a company mm-hmm. at somewhere mm-hmm. you have to start charging so from mm-hmm. day one we started charging today this cohort which is called purple elite contributes to a third of our revenue it contributes to 50% of our repeat revenue mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. only 6% of our customers contribute to this imagine if 20% of our customers become part of this membership loyalty mm-hmm. program i mm-hmm. just think it will contribute to 70% of our revenue that's what our revenue is our revenue right. is what our repeat customers give us not what new customers give us but yeah. look at that point in time there were hundreds of questions saying why should a vertical commerce company mm-hmm. have a loyalty program what right on earth do you have to have this should you give it free above a certain transaction mm-hmm. in those days zomato gold used to come free with airtel something or something something i mean mm-hmm. those don't lead to good customers when you give things free you get free customers only right they don't pay we don't want those customers i mean there is cac which is cost of customer acquisition there is also ccac kachra cost of customer acquisition you know you also acquire kachra customers by throwing in these freebies in fact our data tells us that the more discount you give in your first order the lesser likelihood this customer will repeat with you man good thing <laughs> but you know what do we do we try to set up we try to create an impression in the mind of consumers that we are we offer you better value for money mm, mm. but that's counterintuitive right higher the discount in first order lower the second order propensity this is what our data suggests us and there is causality there is no correlation i am referring to this causality right higher the order size of first order higher the repeat mm. lower mm. the discount higher the repeat if you are right. part of a elite membership higher the repeat then what mm. is the point in acquiring customers by giving discounts i mean right. you can solve your problem today by showing some numbers saying oh yeah i am acquiring a million customers but maybe out of them 3000 300000 are useless so i All think right. just i think trusting yourself to do the right thing sometimes data will tell you sometimes data may not tell you but i think just in your heart you know that this is not the right thing to do and mm-hmm. what is the right thing to do if you can persist at it for long enough i think it works mm-hmm. if you don't persist at it for long enough then you know sort of somewhere you just give it away to somebody else and and you lose that edge or leadership that you have right no very interesting so you know you had 100000 dollars in the bank and i think from there you drove the business to 200 crores in top line and to profitability right yes we had 70000 dollars to be exact <laughs> okay even better and if you you know i think you went through it so if you were to summarize the top 3 business decisions you took that helped you you know get there what would those be i think you touched upon them but you know if you can just summarize them i think differentiate i mean differentiate for your core consumer my core consumer was this tier 2 city woman who mm. wanted exciting products who wanted them at value for who wanted them at a price point that she could afford and those products were not available in third party brands at those price points 
and mm. so we created those products and it just worked magic for us i mean you know in many times what happens is when it comes to personal nuances you you referred to this in early part of our interview where you said was there a personal problem you were trying to solve in fact i think personal problem has a bias of not looking at data and i'll tell you why we used to look at this data and we found that there was a lipstick called l18 which used to sell at 100 rupees we used to get a lot of traffic but mm-hmm. it didn't used to convert which means that there is demand at that price point we are not able to convert it mm-hmm. what we did we launched a spectacular lipstick at i think 105 rupees it was mm-hmm. called ny bay creamy matte lipstick mm-hmm. it felt as good as a 6 700 rupee lipstick when you applied it on your lips obviously mm-hmm. we compromised on packaging to make it cheaper right i think our lipstick volumes went up seven times in one day right. but you know we live in tier 1 cities we earn tier 1 salaries we mm. will never create a product at 100 rupees because we don't think people around us will consume it mm. so we are not building for businesses for us we are building businesses for our consumers till date it happens to be the number one makeup brand on purple when we have maybelline and lakme running discounts right so i think you know look at data Mm-hmm. and you know there is always a very creative way to look at data to be honest there's one more data point i recently looked at and i thought wow i mean this is possible so we recently did a brand track of for one of our brands in skincare good vibes what i found in that brand track was there are many brands in india mm-hmm. which have zero or nearly zero tom plus font awareness mm. and they are 200 crore brands right so yep. obviously you have the large guys from unilever or even a mama earth which has probably the mm-hmm. best awareness in terms of top of the mind and spontaneous recall mm-hmm. but there are many brands which are less than 4 or 5 tom plus font and these are actually mm-hmm. 200 crore brands what i'm taking away from this is historical logic was you build awareness and then the brand will get to 100 150 200 crores but to build awareness you have to burn money in the early years right but here i am seeing 200 crore brands being built without that quote and quote mm-hmm. awareness of tom and spond which means mm-hmm. you can build 200 crore rupee brands by sitting on it for 4 5 years and doing the right things right. you don't need to spend right. money on tv mm-hmm. or youtube too much mm-hmm. so i think you can look at data and derive opportunities you can also mm-hmm. look at data and not derive opportunities you have to just back yourself and say look data is suggesting something maybe there is something that is against what my usual belief systems are and mm-hmm. i must try it that's that's one of the things that has always helped us got it and you know given you spoke so much about data and you know that's an area where i know there are a lot of founders that are sitting on a lot of data you know given the website customers traffic all of that but usually you know they are a bit lost on where to start you know in terms of mining insights etc what would your guidance be you know be it resources you know that you can point them to and i also you know we we should talk about your first hire for data as well but we can cover that later but yeah what would your general advice be on where to start you know i think it's a culture that one needs to build of looking at data it's a little painful to go through but i think it's magical otherwise there are too many biases we as human beings have on i mean i can 100% assure you that if you go to 100 websites today selling products most of them will offer you additional discounts for being a first customer right first time customer but i'm telling you opposite of that the more discount you give the lesser the repeat right it's not true mm-hmm. for just us as a company it's true overall right. right so i think data culture needs to start from the founders i think there are two ways to do it and perhaps both are needed you know we were lucky that we have a co-founder who is also our cto i just think his grasp on data is exceptional and mm-hmm. that sort of propelled us into looking at such reams of data which otherwise wouldn't have been possible you know today we obviously deploy best in class data practices like data warehousing data lake we yeah. have access to significantly more amount of data than most people have but i just think it's a mindset you know i am unfortunately not in a position to say where to start from but i think yeah. if you have a good data science guy in your company and if you can support him with infrastructure to run multiple experiments using data then i think you're in in good shape maybe let me try and help you there you know granted you had a you know a co-founder who was super data savvy but if you were look at that first year when you know you were working on the data etc were there like any top 2 3 priorities that you had for for the whole data mining initiative what what you wanted to 
you know, achieve at the end of it. I think the first and foremost thing we wanted was, can we store our data in a format that is mineable by lots of people? Mm-hmm. I mean, I just think storage of data itself is a problem that one needs to solve for initial. Mm-hmm. Because what ends up happening is your data typically sits in very different tables right. and joining those tables and getting data out becomes cumbersome. Mm-hmm. So if you have a good data warehouse, if you have a good data lake, just life becomes significantly sorted. Anyone mm-hmm. who knows basic SQL can then get you data. Right, right. What Got you it. need to do is keep building hypotheses and keep checking those hypotheses with that data. Mm-hmm. Obviously, today, you know, with expertise we have, we can run multivariate analysis to figure out what yeah. uh, what parameter causes what right. impact on the business. But I would say just start with infrastructure for data, right. because if you don't have that set up, then it's very hard to do things manually after you have large sums of data. Got it. Understood. So, you know, you worked on data and, you know, you cracked customer acquisition at, at a very competitive cost, etc. But then as you were pushing, you know, as you were scaling, what were, you know, some of the ground rules that you said that help you, you know, keep the acquisition costs in check as you scale, right? Because that's a common challenge across the portfolio and you push yeah. hard. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very good question. And I think competition will keep increasing. It's a given that, you know, we should yeah. all assume. If we think we have three competitors, we probably have 30 competitors. Mm. So it's just that we don't see them on an everyday basis, but they're all taking share from the same advertising platform that you need to advertise on. Yeah. I mean, if a Maruti is buying ads on YouTube, your mm. ads will become expensive. And if there is IPL, your ads will become expensive. If there is mm-hmm. Diwali, your ads will become expensive and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. So I'll tell you what we've done and I'll give you an example of recent past. I think three years ago, our cost per install of app used to be X. Mm-hmm. Today, that cost per install is about 2.5 X. Right. But our CAC has only increased by 20% mm-hmm. because we have been working on conversion rate optimization. Mm-hmm. So keep talking to your customers. Mm-hmm. You will find those small nuggets which will improve your conversion rate by 10-15%. See, the market is progressing. The customer's expectations from you as a platform are changing. Mm-hmm. But you seem to be stuck somewhere two years ago. And if that is the case, then your conversion rates will probably stay where they were. But then the increasing cost of media will come and bite you. If you can mm-hmm. offset the cost of increase in the cost of media by improvement in conversion rate, then you can stay good. Right. It's just very, very straightforward. So what we do every day is as a product team, we continuously work on how can we reduce, how can we increase our conversion rate for both new and repeat customers. And like small increases today at our scale obviously give us a lot of benefit. But I'm saying any increase that gives you 10% benefit in your conversion rate. If your conversion rate was 2 and now becomes 2.2, mm-hmm. your CAC has come down by 10%. And continuously work on it. There is no upper cap to what conversion rate you can get to. I mean, right. today the conversion rates we sit on, we never imagined this two year, three years ago. But then we also never imagined that our CPMs will go up so much and therefore our CPIs will go up. I mean, YouTube, Google and Facebook are not in your control. They will keep increasing prices by... 35% every six months. Mm-hmm. I think it's your it's your responsibility as a business to make sure that you also improve your conversion rate so that so that your CAC stays under control. Got it. So you had strong focus on increasing conversion rates, but again, the theory is conversion rates also plateau out at a certain ballpark, right? But you you think that even at your scale, and then it'll help if you can give some ranges. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, I don't remember it exactly, but I think our cost per install used to be 18 rupees mm-hmm. three years ago. Now it's 40, 42 rupees. Our CAC used to be 200 rupees is now probably 230 to 40 rupees. Mm-hmm. Right. So CAC hasn't gone up, but cost per install has gone up. And where are conversion rates today? I don't know it exactly, but I think yeah. it, it must be 2.1, 2.2 times of what it was Got three it. years ago. Understood. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, you know, what would your... And look, there are many... Ca- and you have to look at where all the customer drops are happening. I'll give you an example. I mean, I'm giving you two or three examples of how we worked on it. You know, we used to ask customers to sign up using email ID. We then changed it to phone number with an OTP. Mm-hmm. Sometimes the OTP did not used to get delivered because of some screw up at the telecoms end. So right. the customer couldn't log in. If the customer mm-hmm. can't log in, the customer can't place an order on the app. Mm-hmm. Very recently, we moved to Truecaller... So we know on this phone, what is the phone number of the SIM card. So we don't need to send OTP. Our 
sign ups have gone up by 15%. Mm. So you know you know where the drop offs are if 100 people come to a page and 75 only go ahead and you don't see a reason why that should happen then you should ask yourself this question what can i do to change it mm. right? right i mean i think you cannot accept it and say this is okay for example let's say now you go to our home page right and let's say out of 100 people who visit our home page only 70 go ahead and 30 drop off you should ask a question did i not show you something relevant mm. i mean i think 90 should go ahead maybe 10 should go back maybe because they came by mistake right but why are you okay with 70 going ahead and mm. the question to answer to that lies in personalization if i show you something very relevant the moment you open the app then you're likely to go ahead otherwise there are 100 apps on your phone right got so it so i think you should you do continuously ask this question i mean look mm. maybe they will conversion rates will plateau at some point in time but not for us i mean we are probably far away from that yeah i mean if you look at apps which we all use and love those apps are significantly better than most e-commerce apps we use i mean google maps is better it's very intuitive it can predict what you want where you want to go when i am at home and i put on the google maps in my car it tells me it automatically shows me office when i am at office it shows me automatically home in the night it just knows it is why should i type every time mm. right the first thing that i should see is the most relevant thing that is there for me in 8 out of 10 cases that's when we will become better otherwise we are just uh, like you know otherwise we are not as good products as we right. want ourselves to be yeah so you know clearly it's about focusing on the fundamentals and conversion rates and keeping an eye on that as as you scaled up you know the other important factor in uh, capital efficient scaling is the team and org culture itself yes, yes. and you know one of the serious arguments pushbacks that i always get with respect to capital efficient growth is that you need a lot of capital to attract top tier talent so how did you manage to attract and hire top tier talent when you know when you had such less capital you know i'll tell you the best way to attract talent is through referral at our scale at any scale i don't think we are smart enough to judge people in interviews so you know when you are at whatever scale you are you figure out how many important people you need in your system i am assuming that number of people is not more than 5 or 6 if you are telling me that you are a founder and you are not even resourceful enough to get four people to work with you it's not about money do mm. it's about am i persisting enough with this individual to join me or not and obviously you have a way to compensate in the form of esops you have to be nice to people in terms of esops you have to be transparent your esop policies have to be nice to employees we have an accelerated vesting in our esop policy okay. we have equal vesting over 4 years we don't do this 10 20 30 40% right mm-hmm. and we just commit to people that look if at any given point in time there's a time to cash out i will make sure that you get your money before i get mine i mean as long as you can instill that kind of trust in people people join you right i think when you have to recruit a few people key leaders i don't mm-hmm. think it's about money i think mm-hmm. it's about you being resourceful enough to reach out to your colleagues your ex colleagues your friends to recommend some people to join you and you pay them handsomely in esops i mean today we have people at purple whose esops are worth closer to 100 crores mm-hmm. you know we are not a 10 billion dollar company Yeah. but these are people who have helped help build this company and this is what they deserve in fact i love working with entrepreneurs i think if you ask me what's the purpose of my life my life's purpose would be to work with entrepreneurs and build something massive and so we have now 10 entrepreneurs working in purple perhaps because they get autonomy here i don't know i mean i don't know what attracts them but i think they get compensated handsomely in terms of in terms of their esops and i think it's our job to share wealth with people amazing i right? you know we should talk separately you should consider raising your own fund later if that's the purpose of your life <laughs> so yeah but uh, look i don't do minority transactions <laughs> fair enough you know the other thing is you spoke about key employees but you know the other common challenge that founders face is you know with middle and lower employees there's there's always this churn and uh, you know there are issues around people you know moving on once the appraisal happens etc so any you know best practices that that you can talk about you know i think lesser number of people in the firm are better than more number of people it forces you to prioritize instead of doing all things and so you don't end up doing anything well 
I think if you have lesser number of people, you just do better things. And you become very successful at it before you get into something else. I just think with more number of people, you have this lure that, you know, I can do many things at a time. And you basically don't do anything really well. I think purely from a team point of view, you know, uh, level minus one, minus two point of view. I think in your early days, treat them like family. I mean, most people used to, you know, most of them had ESOPs. Just to give you a perspective, even our office boy has ESOPs, mm-hmm. right? He's been with us for six or seven years, right? right? He doesn't know what he's sitting on, but maybe his future generations will benefit from ESOPs he has. So I think from our point of view, you know, we've been hopefully generous in, in doling out ESOPs. Obviously, our price per share has, has been going up and so everyone's benefited from it. And look, I think in our initial years, we've treated them like family. I mean, we knew about them. We knew when there was a pain point. And if we could solve it, we solved it. If we couldn't solve it, you know, we did lose some people. Right. And I think it's okay. Yeah. You know, I can see quite a few questions coming in. So let me just, you know, run through a few other topics that I wanted to cover. Oh. You know, one of the important ones is just the, you know, the fundraising environment, you know, I've known you since uh, those days when, you know, peers in the same segment had raised a lot of capital and, you know, you stayed heads down and built purple. And I know how, how difficult the environment was and the general perception was. So, you know, what gave you, you know, today you're able to speak very objectively about that whole journey, but back then, what gave you the belief that, uh, you know, you could drive the business to, you know, sustainability. And I see a few questions here around, you know, how you can react when peers raise, you know, more capital and resort to discounting, etc. So it would, would just be useful to understand how, you know, what gave you the belief that you could pull it off and, and drive it to profitability back then? I think two parts to this answer. One is, I think, just create a financial model which shows you that you can get to profits and tweak those assumptions to figure out what's the most likely assumptions you can hit to hit profitability. I mean, I do this even today, where if I want to create plans which are 5 or 10 years forward, I keep looking at our assumptions, keep adding new businesses. But I think you have to do this exercise for yourself. You have to say, look, if I have to become profitable, these are the 3 or 4 key levers that have to change. And hopefully by this much, right? Mm -hmm. Then you ask yourself this question, is it possible or not? Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's possible, right? You have to compromise on one or two things in life and it's possible. Maybe sometimes you'll have to compromise for scale. But look, Mm -hmm. what's the point of scale if you're running out of money? Yeah. I think the most important thing people don't realize is that India will grow at 8-9% year on year. If you stay in this country alive for 20 years and if you are half as intelligent, you will grow at 20% year on year. That's brilliant. There's no problem. You don't have to compare yourself every day to somebody else and say, oh, you know, this guy is growing faster, I'm growing slower, am I wasting my time, so and so forth. You can't compare yourself to people. It's just not happening. Their resources are different. Maybe their shape of mind is different, whatever. I mean, their their people are different. We can't compare ourselves. So look, eight years ago, I stopped having newspaper at home. I don't have DTH connection at home for last eight, nine years. I just don't watch news. Mm. I think it just creates FOMO. There is no yeah. need. No, I mean, absolutely. what you're focused on is those 10 hours in a day, am I using it the best way I can? And do it in the best way according to your values. For example, one of my values was, I don't want to be there in the media. Mm-hmm. And I think we have not been in media for a long period of time. Because we don't want people to come and ask us things. We're just building something. Let us build it large enough for us to come out. And maybe then we'll have better answers to give. Because at that point in time, we had no answers. But we don't want to be in media. We don't want to tell people what our targets for next year are. Because what if we don't achieve them? The best thing with investors is to build credibility. What you say is what you deliver. If that's what you do, most investors will love you. If you say something and don't deliver on it, then any if it happens two, three times in a row, then you're going to lose trust and credibility. We never wanted to do that. I mean, the entire world quotes GMV. We don't quote GMV. We are not in GMV business. We don't look at GMV hurry in our company. I mean, for last five years, we've not looked at it. We don't know what our GMV is today. I'm being very honest to you. I don't know it. We look at net sales, net of returns, cancellations, and discounts. So build a business plan, which potentially takes you to profitability or a EBITDA break even. Figure out what are the levers you need to change. 
I think second, I'll tell you in our case what really helped, and I think it might be a good guardrail when VCs invest in founders and also when founders look to start companies is you know whenever because we are three co-founders and we have absolutely hundred percent trust in each one. If one is low, the other is on a high, and so we keep ourselves balanced. There are days when one guy wants to take a large risk. and the other guy says you know the risk adjusted return doesn't look as good can we please relook at it so i think just we have this benefit of this trio working on the problem and it's magical how this trio operates there is one guy who's always on the business he's our cto mm-hmm. he's today solving how to scale up our technology infrastructure our data and so on and so forth mm-hmm. and then there is rahul and me who are probably like i wouldn't be shy away from calling it rayna and dhoni if we look into the eyes of each other we know what the other guy is going to say and so i'll shut up so right. there's extremely high chemistry when one is bullish the other is more balanced and sort of so look in times of distress when we were running out of money competition was raising money we just had to tell ourselves look you know if we hit this milestone we'll be able to make it and i think we all worked towards it i love that answer you know especially the first part on just being in india and uh, the effect of compounding extremely well said and you know right now it's a lot of what you said is you know also common sense and you know looking at things very rationally but but it's very hard you know as a founder to actually you know follow this so at a personal level when you were going through this and you know there was a peer raising capital and investors telling you that this could be a winner take all you're going nowhere etc were there any practices you know resources that that help you get to you know the zone you are in today you know you had great co-founders that definitely help but you know anything else like for instance it's pertinent in the current environment because you know there are a lot of founders you know that could be staring at a protracted period where you know their fundraising may be challenging and peers could could raise funds out of the blue what would you recommend at a personal level for founders you know i think um... i mean this is a hard answer but for people to listen to but i think i think be honest to yourself and tell yourself what is it that you really would love to do and then go ahead and do it don't be persuaded by what market tells you to do i right. think it's very hard to be honest to yourself because when you are in the midst of doing things and you your mind is cluttered you tend to do more complex things and you tend to miss common sensical things Hmm. you have to just tell yourself you know this is what i really enjoy doing and if i do this well there is some chance that i can break out and if you do it with your full you know honesty i think you come out winner in a couple of years or so just that you know it's it's hard to speak to yourself honestly because you're always under some sort of pressure from media from investors from from employees from whatever you know around you people around you i think you just have to be honest to yourself right you can't be playing this game for somebody else i mean no, forget your investors they don't give them any return just do well for yourself if you do well for yourself you'll do well for them unless you're doing it through unethical means but just do well for yourself you know don't worry about investors it's okay one year they don't make any irr it's okay maybe some mm-hmm. other year it'll be bumper irr they don't need an irr every year they need an irr yeah. average over 5 7 years it's okay absolutely. to have two bad years there's no problem No, absolutely. You know, we have a lot of questions, so I'm just going to start taking them one by one. And for founders listening in, a request. Uh, you know, we've put up a feedback form in the chat window, so you know it'll just help. It should be quick, and it'll just help us, you know, improve over time. So you know, let me start uh, coming back to the questions. Uh, let me start with the first one. Hi, Manish. Can I get your two cents on how Purple is looking at Kirana outlets? as the potential source for incremental business how are you prioritizing that i mean look i don't know how it benefits your customers so maybe you know people who are listening to this call i mean i think we are doing it so we are increasing our distribution of our own brands today we sell our brands in about 5000 outlets you know we are sending it so we are increasing our distribution but i think hari let's pick up questions that will benefit listeners no i agree them. yeah let me just you know scan through the list I think we covered the second one, third one. So yeah, I think there's a question on would starting Purple's business today achieve the growth you have? What impact do D two C brands have on a company like Purple? I mean, I think having more supply benefits us. So 
you know i think they are also trying to understand uh, you know more the bpc category in terms of growth rate and whether there's space for if i were to paraphrase it space for more brands i think there is space for a lot of brands i think you need mm-hmm. to have your voice that is i'll give you an example here there's a brand we absolutely adore it's a brand that we ended up investing in it's called carmezi right uh, it's a brand in feminine hygiene space mm-hmm. they used to make sanitary pads everybody and their uncle we spoke to when we were doing the investment said please don't do this deal because mm-hmm. this is a category where you know png and jnj will not let you survive mm-hmm. look given that we had done very well on our own brands we just told ourselves great this is contra nobody wants to do it we should definitely do it mm-hmm. i think what we loved about the brand is the voice it has you know hari you'll be surprised every single product they launch goes out of stock in the first month itself mm-hmm. it is just rock star performance on just the brand voice is so strong that every product they launch does very very well obviously we run the risk that because all product moves so fast sometimes if the product is not very good we don't get time to recall it and that has happened in one case but the brand has grown 20 times in 16 months since we acquired wow i'm just saying it's on steroids because the founders believe that this is a mission in life that they want to accomplish you know you should look at the light in their eyes they'll say you know manish the day we hit 100 crores of net revenue you know what an achievement would it be we bought it when it was less than 20 lakhs a month right i just think the brand is so strong it's absolutely privileged to own it i mean i think those founders are not lucky to have us as shareholders we are lucky for you know we are lucky to have them as our portfolio i mean what an achievement it is like we've done like those guys are absolutely magic and the brand is so i think there is a room to create lots of brands the brand is called carmezi somebody's asked this question yeah no we are m e s i yeah look at their instagram channel and you'll know why it's special i think if you can create a unique voice and if your voice is honest to what you do instead of you know again that's where i keep saying you know i think there is honesty and focus are two big weapons that every founder carries don't ever lose it focus gets you to success in one area that success gets you a lot of capital and then you you can use that capital to focus on two or three more things and honesty gets you to success and honesty gets you a voice which is so unique to yourself that other people can't copy it you know you can't copy my culture you can't copy my choices you can't copy my design because at some point in time you will never be able to do a great job as what i do on my own design no you know, in carmezi we don't use any agency for even mm-hmm. shoot of our ads it's scripted in house and it's yeah. shot in house no i think in house created is something we recommend strongly as well and can't agree more about brand voice you know it's one of the biggest considerations when we invest as well on that you know i know that purple has been investing in you know brands as well so in your view what separates the great from from the good in d2c brand you know brand voice is clearly one any other you know factors that i think we look for a team because we love to work with entrepreneurs so we look for a team that is balanced a team that can do brand and a team that can look at operations and pnl mm-hmm. side by side and take a uh, good judgment calls on what is the right thing for the business to do at this point in time mm-hmm. uh i think third we look for differentiation not really in product i think product differentiation is hard we look for differentiation in mindset you know this is how i want to build it versus what everybody else is built. but look the first two ones are the ones that you mentioned which is one yeah. is brand voice yeah what kind of consumers will you attract as early customers mm mm-hmm. and second is we look at the team team which is good complementary skill set of brand pnl operations technology data and so on so correct and we go to this question on data the question is on what saas tools have helped you and does one need a full blown data team and saas infra since the beginning at what scale do you think a startup should start focusing on building a data team You know, so we've not used SaaS tools. We've built it in house. So I don't know if there are SaaS tools that help you build it. I think you can write to suyash. dot k at purple. dot com. He'll be able to help you with all the SaaS tools that exist. Suyash heads is our co-founder and CTO. He's the best person to help you with that. 
what's the right time to you know invest in a data science team i think i think if your technology stack is slightly well set and if you are willing to invest in data it doesn't take a lot of people it probably takes three four people to build it it's not a hell lot i mean you know that's all right. i'm saying it's yeah. just a mindset saying this team is very long term in nature if tomorrow mm-hmm. you're looking for growth for next month this team will not have any ideas if you're right. willing to be that long term then i think you should invest in this data team very very early yeah and and our view is similar i, I think this no stage that's too early to start focusing on data and i hope i got suyash's id correct yes you're uh, right yeah. perfect great you know i think uh the next question is on interesting what is the reason that in bpc both the leading players nike and purple have been frugal and have good unit economics unlike other e-commerce categories i think there could be many reasons for it i can only guess this i think both of us came from financial services so both of us probably understood pnls better than most people do and i think the other correlation is both of us were born in bombay maybe we never had the pressure of building it in bangalore or gurgaon that's interesting <laughs> okay i realize we are you know it's already five can we take five more minutes manish is that okay yeah, yeah no problems yeah topic okay. you know relating to the data question uh, the other uh, factor i've seen you emphasize a lot on is this culture of experimentation you know velocity yes. of experimentation etc yes. so could you just talk through what that means at a company level and at a more functional level what what does that really mean culture of you know velocity of experimentation as a core value i think that's a good question and you know i think as humans we have lots of biases i think most of those biases are wrong and so we try what we try and encourage people at purple is to do lots of experiments and test those biases for example and when i say experimentation the way to do experimentation is very very clear cut you have a hypothesis you write that down then you run the experiment on a certain set of consumers make sure that there are no other experiments being run on those consumers and then look at the data and present what happened right mm-hmm. and so when i say velocity of experimentation as a system you have to enable velocity of experimentation mm. and for that you will need a good data science capability what what i need what founders need to enable is do i have the capability to run 25 experiments on my customers at any given point in time mm. because you mm. know you may want to run five different experiments on new customers five different experiments on repeat customers and so and so forth and if you don't segregate your data and enable ab testing you will not be able to sort of know the right result so what i what, the 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 reason to encourage velocity of experimentation is very simple we have too many biases it's a versus b's opinion we don't want that let's do an experiment within two weeks we will know what as a system we struggle sometimes to do is do we enable it enough so that we can run multiple experiments at a time where mm-hmm. one day one set of customers is not impacted by any other change except that this one change the experiment that you do got it got it the next question is on how do you look at your repeat data what short term levers if at all have have you figured out to boost repeat there are no short term levers yeah. to boost repeat unfortunately Actually, 100% i'm going to you know it's going to be a quick fire we'll try and cover as many questions how is your allocation of time on various aspects of running the business changed as the company has grown yeah good question uh, i think today i spend 70% of my time on hr my job is to uh, to i mean today when we are a 150 million dollar business my job is to inspire people to dream bigger and and that inspiration doesn't happen overnight it takes time for people to believe in themselves and so i spend most of my time sort of speaking to people internally and making sure that they that they dream first mm-hmm. of all and then they start working towards those dreams from a professional point of view that's that's the job i mean 4 5 years ago i used to be very actively involved in doing things which sku are we launching in which brand all of that stuff i used to do today that's not really the case in 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 hindsight this is brilliant it's not mm-hmm. something i had set out for i never right. wanted to do hr in my life but i just mm-hmm. think there is no way to run a large business than to be a brilliant people's leader where you coach them to dream big and then take risks to achieve those dreams absolutely the next question is what were the key drivers of driving adoption in tier 2 towns in the first 2 3 years of business i think vernacular communication was one of the big levers to drive adoption in tier 2 and tier 3 towns got it and the again last... it was contrary 
we like yeah. to consume content in english we look down upon content in hindi and in local languages but unfortunately that's the king right. i mean you know i'll tell you how we, how did we come to this realization we released a video in hindi with a normal girl on her channel on youtube it was called kajal lagane ke che aasan tarike we also launched a similar video in english with a tv actress with many more followers in english it was called six ways to apply kajal the english video got 600000 views the hindi video got 25 million views the writing was on the wall right you are not the customer yeah. the customer yeah. is somebody else build for them don't build for yourself the next one is on physical stores purple tried physical stores and closed it then i uh, purple plans to open physical stores what was the learning from the experience and how are you approaching it differently now here i think we we tried one physical store because of some misadventure we closed it in 3 months because we didn't have bandwidth now this year we are going to get back to physical stores you should see something come out in next 3 4 months perfect more pin code level data to predict where will be more successful and where mm-hmm. will be less successful right and final two questions uh, manish you know first one is what is something you know that you would have preferred you had known when you started purple trust yourself not more Fair. Be honest to yourself and trust yourself. Your building is for yourself. You can't do it for somebody else. No, absolutely, and it's about you know, like have planet. this belief in you to take contra bets. I think this is the year when VCs should write the most number of checks. But unfortunately, no, they will not. But <laughs> no, I'm saying we have the, a lot of dry powder that should not. Be yeah. Done. So look, I'm not referring yeah. to specifically DSG, but I'm <laughs> saying in general, now valuations are saying you should. Right. Everyone should double down, but probably. you know that will not happen and i think one should take contra bets this is our job perfect and before my last question a request to the audience again please fill up the form it will just help us you know learn and improve better and the last question manish you said the journey began as a business idea the you know you scaled up successfully now so what keeps you going now and you know, what's what's the plan from here on i think my dreams <laughs> you know they keep me going i think i have a very large dream my dream is to be- build a multi billion dollar sales company out of purple i think we are only at 150 to 100 million dollars right so we have a long way to go uh, it may not happen only in india it might have to happen outside but i think the ambition is to build probably the largest beauty company out of it and for that to happen i think it will take 10 15 more years but i am at it. no that's that's awesome and money is this last and and i think there were a lot of lessons for the founders so thank you again for for joining us and and thank you everyone for for joining us you know see you soon in in the next episode of brick by brick